All right, I think that's a good place to end for today. So, amen. Whew, yes. I, you know, I, I, I couldn't help but thinking uh, as I was watching these kids do what they do. Um, I've been here long enough to just see the, see the investment in time. Um, and uh, these kids invest a lot of time to do this, obviously, and we, we, we love them for it. We, we can't help but love them. They're our kids, right? But I, will, but I, I want to thank the parents because that's something that we run into a lot. It's just we run into it in life where we'll get, uh, we'll get families or young people that will say, hey, I want to be involved in X, Y, and Z. And the door is open. But a lot of times, you know, parents, we, we, we got jobs, we've got the car in the shop, we've got things that keep us from being able to maybe make the investment in having them here. So these kids were here last night, all their parents had to bring them. And they were here this morning at 9 a.m. and all their parents had to bring them. Well, except for maybe Micah, I mean, he can drive, and Z. A few of them can drive, but you know. Um, and this is all kid-led. So, Katie, you arranged all this stuff today, right? This was your arrangement? Yes. It was a beautiful arrangement. Beautiful. And, um, and, and, um, and Abram drove all the way up from, I don't know, South St. George to get here today, right? Pace, Payson, I think, right? So, um, so there's a huge investment in time. And what I was thinking about as I was watching these kids is... Um, I may get this a little bit wrong, but I think this all started with Zach Parks and Eddie Brown, um, and then um, Craig Chaya stepped in, and and um, I know then there was Sarah for a while, Sarah Grady, and so. This, this all started with a group of not just parents, but mentor adults that stepped in and said, hey, this is something that, this is, this is a gift that can be passed on at an early age. And as those adults drifted off the scene for various reasons, it's miraculous to me that now they're leading themselves. You know? So, um, Occasionally, you have kids and you go, I don't know how many of you think this, you have kids and you go, and they say, oh, your kids are so good at X, Y, Z, and you go, I do not know where they got that from. It wasn't me. I wasn't this good. So, anyway, thank you all, young people. We are blessed by you. So this sermon, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue. The last time I was talking about the book of Ecclesiastes, and because of uh, time pressure, I ended it where I, I intentionally ended it where I ended it. But I, afterwards, I had somebody come up and go, oh, that was the most depressing sermon I've ever heard. And I said, yeah, you know, I get that because of where I ended it. I ended it, I was talking about Solomon and... And his history and how he became king and at what point in his life he probably wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. And I ended it by saying this is a guy who's in a midlife crisis and he doesn't see any way out. All the doors are closed to him. He, all the things he thought would be there as he became a great man and a great philosopher and a great king, they weren't there the way he expected it to be. And that's where we ended. It's a lovely topic. So I want to tell you this, today it'll be a lot more upbeat because this was the end of that sermon actually. And I've just padded it a little bit to make it last long enough to make it worth your gas money to come to church. Amen. Right. So, um, and, and, and for the kids, I want you to know that there is a subtitle to this sermon that will give you a hint of something fun that's coming. And this is the sermon that will answer the question of, do dogs go to heaven? It's an age-old question. Now, Brenda Bates, I heard you say yes, but we want to know why. Is it in the Bible? And it is. So we're going to talk about it. All good pets. 
I remember Elizabeth Blackwelder when the Blackwelders lived here, and she was uh, she was one of our violinists. And what were Elizabeth was famous for having strange pets. What were her What were her pets? What, they were like a special kind of cockroaches, right? They were hissing. Madagascar hissing cockroaches. So the question is, do Madagascar hissing cockroaches go to heaven? <laughs> okay, so this will be, be worth talking about then, um, if for no other reason than to get to that answer. Um, but I wanted to ask you, I'm, I want you to think about something as we begin today. And that is... I don't know how, much, how many of you write for a living, or like your writing is very important in your profession, or maybe you at some point in high school or college or something remember a moment when you had to write something that was extremely important and how you wrote it mattered a lot. Maybe your grade depended on it or somebody's life depended on it or whatever. And have you ever had an experience where as you're writing something like that, um, you just, you, you get it written and then you just write it, rewrite it and rewrite it and rewrite it and you read it again and you go, I need a better word. This whole sentence, I think if I had the right word, I could just punch this a lot better and you're just, con- you're, you know, you're thinking about the cadence of it. And, you know, your word choices and sentence structure, and you want to get it exactly right. You know, this is, not, this is not 100% the same, but I do remember when I was a student at Andrews University, Dwight Nelson was a, was the pa- came to be the pastor at Andrews University while I was there. So that tells you a little bit about how old I am because Dwight's retired now. But Dwight was a young pastor then, and he came... I won't tell you which year of my 30-year college career he came in, but he did come there, and I remember Dwight early on. I don't know if he had this at the end of his uh, preaching days. He's still preaching, but, I, but he had this, um, this mechanism when he was preaching where if he wanted you to pay attention, does anybody know what Dwight would do? He would use a certain literary style. Do any of you ever watch a Dwight Nelson sermon? Well, he would alliterate. You know, all of a sudden he'd be talking and he would go, you know, and the passionate people on their progress to the promised kingdom, and all of a sudden he would start alliterating and you'd be like, whoa, that was good, and you're listening again, right? He was so good at that. And, um, and to me, that was a, gr- t- a great intentionality, right? I don't think he suddenly burst into alliteration. I think it was him saying, I need their attention right here. I need to be very specific about how I write this. I was, if I, if we, if I wanted to keep you till 1230, I was going to read you some of my favorite poems and Epic stories, and oh, oh, Shakespeare, Henry V, St. Crispin's Day speech, we band of brothers. Read it sometime. Watch it. Listen to it. It makes, it makes you come alive. The heroic speech of Horatius on the bridge. Then out spake brave Horatius, the captain of the gate. To every man upon this earth, death comes soon or late. And how can man die better than facing fearful odds for the ashes of his fathers and the temples of his gods? How stirring the language. I mean, just perfectly rhythmic Oh, anyway, anyway, I could go on and on. Henry, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, the last ride of Paul, or the ride of Paul Revere. Oh, yeah. Good writing, good writing. I love good writing. When Mariella was, uh, was in, in grammar, lower grammar school, um, my wife, 
and I both feel the same way about good reading and writing. And I do remember that, um, that she spent, my wife spent a lot of time with both our kids on, I know that this paper is good enough to get an A, but why not make it great? And, um, and I know that drove Mariella nuts. So she says, eh, I don't know. Hopefully it'll serve, serve someday. Last time, when, as I was walking out of the sanctuary after talking about Solomon, um, a very wise woman, very wise woman, approached me and said, this is my, I love, you want to know what my favorite verse in Ecclesiastes is? And I said, yeah, I want to know. Because I'm pretty sure I know. She told me one completely differently. By the way, you should have Ecclesiastes open. I'm not going to cheat and put them up here for you. You better have it open. Ecclesiastes 12, I, she, she said, this is my favorite verse, Ecclesiastes 12:12. 12, 12. Be warned, my son, so this is Solomon talking, be warned, my son, of anything in addition to them. Solomon is saying, don't change my words at all. And then he says, now, uh, uh, of making many books, there is no end, and much study wearies the body. I just, I, I find that both humorous and incredibly wise. Much study wearies the Bible, or bo- the body, it doesn't weary the Bible. But, um, but if you look at the end of Ecclesiastes, right, so you have this book where Solomon has written it, And you might be inclined to think, this is a very depressing book of the Bible. Why is it in the Bible? All he does is talk about futility. But then at the end, it's like like in a moment of inspiration, he says in chapter 12, verse 9, not only was the teacher wise, but he also imparted knowledge to the people. And he refers this to himself in the third person frequently. He pondered and searched out and set in order many proverbs. The teacher searched to find just the right words. And what he wrote was upright and true. So is this book depressing or is it inspired? Solomon says, I know exactly what I'm saying. I was very intentional when I wrote this. Don't try to add to this or to rationalize. Oh, yo, oh well, this is, he didn't really mean this. So we have to be kind of careful in how we interpret Solomon. But the way Solomon wrote a lot of this book, I believe is intentionally a little bit ambiguous. So, I want to go to the pivot point of the book, the fulcrum on which the teeter-totter tips, and that is in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. So I'm going to pivot my Bible gateway to there. I'm going to close out the obligatory ad. There we go. And I want to go to, we're going we're gonna to spend some time We're going to start in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 10. And this is what Solomon has to say. This is, he he draws three big conclusions in the book of Ecclesiastes. At three points in time, he stops and says, so what can we conclude from this? Here's what we can conclude. This is one of those moments. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 10, I'm reading from the NIV. I have seen the burden God has laid on the human race. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart. It's like poetry. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end I know that there is nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live. And then I want to go, uh, well, here, we can go on. That each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all their toil. This is a gift of God, the gift of God. I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken away from it, taken from it. God does it so that people will fear him. 
And to address the question of do good pets go to heaven, let's go to verse 18. I also said to myself, as for humans, God tests them so that they may see that they are like the animals. Huh. It's kind of a reverse test. You would have thought he'd test the animals to see if they're like the humans, but no. He's going to test the humans to see if they're like the animals. Surely the fate of human beings is like that of the animals. The same fate awaits them both. Huh. As one dies, so dies the other. All have the same breath. Humans have no advantage over animals. Everything is meaningless. (laughs) Sorry, accidentally slipped that in there. All go to the same place. All come from dust, and to dust they return. Who knows if the human spirit rises upward and if the spirit of the animal goes down to the earth. Huh. So, for those of you that love your pet, Madagascar hissing cockroach, Solomon, the wisest man ever, says... Whatever happens to you is going to happen to them. Whew, that's a relief, right? Ah, man, I feel so much better now, I think. I never envisioned my dog going anywhere separate from me. I figured if they're going anywhere, they're going with me, and I think that's a fine thing. I'm just trying to figure out if I'm so blessed as to be in the heavenly kingdom, where I'm going to keep all those dogs, But anyway, at my house, in my house are many mansions, will be many mansions. I feel certain of that. All right. So what, I want to go back to this uh, uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 10. It's one of my favorite, or 11, one of my favorite poetic expressions. And I want to talk about what it means. Um, And that is, in 3 verse 11, He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart. What does it mean that God has set eternity in the human heart, and how does it relate to everything else in the book of Ecclesiastes? And I don't know any other way of doing this other than to almost jump straight to the conclusion. (laughs) The word that is used for eternity here is, um, it's a, and I always hate doing this, but it's a Hebrew word that is spelled aleph, or ayin, lamed mem, A-L-M. And, and ayid is the first consonant, and in Hebrew they don't write the vowels. And so you have to kind of look at the word in the context of the sentence to understand which vowels go with it. Okay, so that word could be alam, alem, olem, olam, depending on which vowels go with it. And... Um, And one of those words means eternity, forever, time since the beginning. And one of them means darkness. And there is nothing definitive that says it's one or the other. uh, Other than the fact that the exact same word is used in verse 14, which is translated, I know that everything God does will endure forever. Forever. Right, so if that word was really darkness, if it was, if, if Solomon was really writing the word darkness, it, that that sentence in the four, in verse fourteen would be, "I know that everything God does will endure darkness," which is probably not what it means. So we can be fairly certain that the word he chose to use here is forever, meaning, and it has this 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 context of starting from the very beginning. Before, before even awareness exists and going on until awareness ends. So God has put that thing, that, that eternity, that, that foreverness 
inside the human heart. This is the conclusion Solomon draws. And by the way, this is a fulcrum of the book. In the first part of Ecclesiastes, if you read it, chapters 1 and 2 are Solomon saying, I tried everything and it didn't work. I tried. I experienced it. And it didn't work. And then he has he concludes by this passage we just read. Then he goes on in chapters 4 through about 8, and he says, so then I decided to observe. I decided to watch. And for, for the, that whole section of the book of Ecclesiastes, his language changes to, from I did to I saw. I saw this. I saw that. I observed this. I observed that. But a lot of the things are kind of along the same lines. I observed that it doesn't make sense, that it's futile. And then at the end of chapter 8, he concludes again. And his exact words in Ecclesiastes 8, 17 are, No one can comprehend what goes on under the sun. Despite all their efforts to search it out, no one can discover its meaning. Even if the wise claim they know, they cannot really comprehend it. And then Solomon moves on in chapters 9 through 12 to giving advice. He says, I did it. None of it made sense. I saw it. None of it made sense. So since nothing makes sense, let me give you some advice. And then he just gives a whole bunch of advice, some of which is very profound and some of which is not. Just a lot of advice. But he concludes at the end of chapter 12, at the very end of the book, with this. And these are the words he uses in, uh, oh, i got to go to Ecclesiastes chapter 12. I'll give you a minute to get there yourself. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 13 and 14. He says this, now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the duty of all mankind. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including everything hidden, every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. There is a way that you can read the book of Ecclesiastes, which almost you you can read Solomon despairing, right? It doesn't make sense. I'm so discouraged. It didn't work out the way I wanted it to. There's really nothing you can do other than just let God sort it all out. But there's also a different way you could read the book of Ecclesiastes. And I want to ask you another rhetorical question right now. Another question to think about this. Have you ever intentionally understated what you thought was a strong argument in order to get someone else to consider it. When if you stated it strongly, they would reject it. Have you ever had this circumstance? Let me give you an example. Um, I'll give you, I have two examples because I feel like I do this at work all day, every day, okay? So this happened just yesterday. A product manager calls me and says, uh, or sorry, my VP of uh, product development, the guy who writes the software calls me up and he says, um, I cannot work with the product manager on this product anymore. Just cannot work with her. She is blah, 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 and he goes on and on and on and on. I can't work with her. You know, um, this is untenable. you got to do something about this, right? Well, I've heard the other side of the story too, and I know that the feeling is mutual. But he is the most senior person by far. By far the most senior, should have the most maturity, should be able to deal with this the the best. My immediate reaction, human reaction, is to say, You need to cool your jets. You are wrong. I know both sides of the story. You need to do A, B, C, and D. 
or this, project, this entire project is going to suffer and maybe fail. If I did that, I know this person and he will immediately reject me. He will immediately reject my argument. So my argument to him instead is, wow, you're right. That is, uh, we are in real trouble here. It feels a little bit like this project may be doomed. Um, the customer is paying us a lot of money for this, and their expectations are A, B, C, and D. What should I do? Should I call the customer and tell them that uh, we can't work together? Right? And immediately the person is, well, no, don't do that. Right? Don't do that. Well, I don't know what else to do. You know, maybe what we could do is, and, you know, and I start, kind of throwing out ideas like, I'm thinking about this for the first time. Maybe we could do this. And within about 15 minutes, he they're they're his ideas, right? He has come up with them. He now knows how to solve the problem. He is going to go make this all better. Right? It was his idea. I'll give you the, the, the most extreme example I can give of this is what I always call negative selling. And I've used this example in church before, so I, I, I think it's okay. The Holy Spirit won't strike me. Um, but frequently, the best way to get somebody to buy something from you is to try and convince them not to. Okay? And I call it negative selling. So an example, many years ago, I was trying to get a company in, uh, in Boulder, Colorado, to invest in my company. And I had driven all the way to Boulder, spent a couple days there pitching all the VCs in Boulder, and um, with, with very, very little success. And uh, I was driving home. I, was in Gold, I remember I was in Golden, Colorado. I was about to head up into the mountains where my cell phone wouldn't, would be intermittent for a while, and my phone rang. And the guy from the last conversation I had, the one I had right before I got in my car to drive home, was on the phone. His name is Trevor. He goes, Dave, I want to talk to you. We were somewhat intrigued by your proposal. It feels like there might be something there. Would you be willing to come back and talk to us some more about it? And I was very discouraged To be honest, I was at the end of a long trip. I'd gotten a lot of rejection. It was Friday afternoon. Couldn't wait to get home. It was pouring rain. I just couldn't wait to get in those mountains and get lost and and get on my way home. And so I said, you know, Trevor, I appreciate it, but this company is not for you. It's all wrong for you. He's like, what are you talking about? And I said, oh, well, you know. And I I said, let me tell you all the reasons it doesn't fit your portfolio. And I just started going through them. Your portfolio looks like this, and my company looks like this. And you don't like doing deals that look like this, and my, my deal looks a lot like that. And I honestly was not trying to trick him or anything, but by the end of that phone call, he was like, Dave, can you fly back on Monday? We want to do this deal. We'll have a term sheet ready for you. And I, and I hung up the phone and I drove home and I was like, what in the world happened there? And I realized that what I had accidentally done was challenged him by saying, you can't do this deal. It was my Jack Nicholson moment. You want me on that wall, Right? I, was, I challenged him, and he's like, no, I really want to do this. No, I think this fits our portfolio better than you think it does. No, you're wrong about that. Don't underestimate my, my, me and my partners. We can manage this. And I realized that sometimes the best way to convince somebody of something is to act like it doesn't, almost doesn't matter. You understate your arguments. And when I ask you if you would consider reading the book of Ecclesiastes as if Solomon is making a very intentionally understated argument. Is he doing this 100% on purpose? Well, imagine Solomon as the king of Israel 
acknowledged, we can see it in the first Kings, acknowledged as the greatest philosopher in the world, the wisest man in the world, kings and princes from nations all around, philosophers and wise men from Egypt, everybody's coming to seek out his wisdom. How do you talk to those people and say, my worldview is monotheistic and it looks like this, without them immediately just viewing it as an, a great argument to have. How do you do it? One way to do it would be to say, man, don't you agree? This world is completely unjust. Oh, yeah, it's so unjust. I mean, the other day, imagine, I watched this rich man, you know, beat up this poor man for a couple bucks that he was owed. Is that fair? No, no, Solomon, that's not fair. No. And, and, and I could give you chapter and verse. I could go on and on and on and talk about how unfair this world is. The philo- there is no philosophy in this world that explains how unfair this world is, how futile, how meaningless, how ridiculous this planet is. Oh, I totally agree. Oh, yeah, I know. You know, it, 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 we, I, we see it the same way. Who can't see the earth this way? And all along, Solomon is planting seeds. that it says, it's unfathomable. But God has put eternity in the hearts of man. There's something inside of you that when God created you, he put it there, and that seed is proof that you were created by the monotheistic God. It is the proof. And when he gets to the end, he says, so the conclusion of all this is you can't win. It's unfathomable, not understandable. We all agree on that. So the best thing you can do is serve God and let him worry about it. I wonder... I wonder, I'm going to make an argument that I'm going to hope to complete next time because the sermon's not written yet, that when it says God put eternity in the hearts of man, that is literally genetic coding that puts something called hope in your heart and my heart. I, I, um, I will read to you the opening, the prelude to the confessions of St. Augustine. Some pastors in much more august institutions than this have gotten in trouble for reading something written by a Catholic. I'm going to attempt it anyway. St. Augustine, writing long before the Catholic Church became the Catholic Church and anybody had anything against them necessarily, wrote a confession. And in the beginning, at the very beginning of it, he says, to praise you is the desire of man, a little piece of your creation. You stir man to take pleasure in praising you because you have made us for yourself. And our heart is restless until it rests in you. Eternity in the hearts of man? Maybe so. We'll talk about it, I hope, next time, whenever that is. But for today, I want to I, I want to ch- challenge is too hard, strong a word because I, I don't have that uh, I don't have any moral high ground to char- challenge you from, but I would ask you to think. Sometimes there are parts of the Bible which we avoid reading or avoid studying a little bit because we can't figure out how to put them in the right context, and yet we are told that all Scripture is. God breathed, useful for correction, all of it. Read the book of Ecclesiastes. I did it, and it and the outcome was unfathomable. I watched it. 
the outcome was unfathomable. I can give you a lot of advice, but the outcome is still going to be unfathomable because you just are created to have hope in God, to have eternity in your soul. You are created yearning for a good outcome. Whether you are Zoroastrian or whatever the religions of the time all around Solomon were, Egyptian, monothe- or polytheist, whatever your religion is, we can all agree you yearn for something better. You hope for something better. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for a beautiful Sabbath morning. Thank you for the opportunity for our souls to gather, to exchange ideas with each other, to praise. Thank you for our young people and all the adults and parents and families that invest in creating, as Bernie said, people that grow up to be bigger praisers. We're so, we, we need this time where there's nothing else for us to do except contemplate you and contemplate praising you. We, are, we want to know what is this eternity that you've put in our hearts and our souls. We want to know how we discover it, how we nourish it, and how we ride it into your presence where we can praise you forever. We ask this in your name. Amen. Blessed Sabbath to you all. Um, I don't know, uh, it doesn't look like the praise team has a postlude uh, in mind. They're, they're all yawning. So um, I just would remind you that we do have a guest lunch downstairs. And if you are here visiting, we'd be, we would love to get to know you. Join us.